glad everybody's here. Holy God, we thank you for the rain that we had. Every drop came from the place that you hold it. Up in the clouds. Amazing. You're a God that refreshes. And we want to be just like the earth, refreshed by your presence that passes by us. And we pray, Father, that more and more we would be able to see that we would really be pure in heart so that we could see you. So that we could see you in every minute of every day uh, to see how grateful we should be, to see how you have organized and been working in our lives even when we were unaware. And just like as we read here in Isaiah, and just like you planned for Cyrus, and just like you planned for Jesus to come, we realize that we are under that same heading of under your will, and we are appreciative, God, that you know about us that you know the day of our death, that you knew us before we were born. And we're grateful that we can have such confidence reading these accounts where you're involved in bringing about and using a, a worldly king and that comparable of bringing about your, your son, the King of Kings. We just pray those ideas would really encourage us to think about how involved you are with us. Because sometimes we face life and we don't know. We just don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going to happen. but we are able to trust you at every turn. And we give you thanks for that. We pray your blessings on those that are in the midst of circumstances right now that they might find it hard to trust you. Help us to have a message of encouragement to them. And most of all, we just pray that you would bless them. We thank you, God, for every opportunity that you've given us to be able to serve. And we pray that just like your son, just as he was a servant to everyone that he came in contact with, we pray for that same spirit about us, God, that we would be servant to all men. That we would become all things to all men that by some means we might save some. Put in our mouth a message of reconciliation. Put in our heart a motivation to do that. Put in us a willingness to speak and communicate on behalf of of your resurrected son whose life was indestructible it couldn't be contained by the grave he, he couldn't die like that help us who claim our eternal life in connection with him help us to be bold servants who will speak your word. Bless our young people, God. They face so many challenges. We pray that you would lift them up. We pray for the parents 
And for us as grandparents, that you would bless us and use us in every way to minister to those kids. We thank you today for our nation and pray for our president. And for those who are working with him. We pray, Father, that you would look over across the way and Help us to be mindful that we live in a very pleasant community. But even our community is more and more reflecting, mirroring the ideals of our culture and our nation. And we pray that we would be salt. That we would be light. Thank you for our opportunity to study today. Open our eyes and our minds to your word. And bless us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Uh, did we finish 47? I know we started it. We didn't finish it? Okay. I couldn't remember where we got to. Okay. Verse 9. Verse 9. That's perfect. So remember, we're talking about Babylon. This is a message about Babylon. We notice Queen of the Babylonians, verse 1, uh, twice over, uh, that use again in verse 5, to kind of get us in view there. And there was arrogance. That was the problem. Uh, verse 6, they showed no mercy, even to the aged. And you said to yourself, I am forever the eternal queen. So, they are setting themselves up as if they are not going to be taken down. And we made that comparison even to America and how our nation kind of sounds like that a lot of times. Or the spirit of people within the nation kind of sound like that. Verse 8, Now then, listen, you lover of pleasure, lounging in your security, and saying to yourself, I am, and there is none besides me. I'll never be a widow or suffer the loss of children. Well, both of these will overtake you in a moment in a single day. Loss of children and widowhood. A woman widowhood would be a bad deal. Loss of children would be a bad deal. For both of those to happen on the same day, that is the, the kind of thing that God is, it's, a, it's an extra spirit of calamity. It is a similar uh, thing to what Job experienced in the loss of all of his children. You know, to lose a child is horrible. To lose all of them is the pinnacle of that kind of grief. Well, God is trying to picture the problem uh, of their arrogance and what is going to come. They will come on you in full measure. Look, in spite of your many sorceries. You see, that's where they were sort of putting their... They were putting their confidence. They were hunkering down on these sorcerers and these spells. Uh, and that's again going to be brought up. Uh, verse 10, you have trusted in your wickedness and you have said, no one sees me. Now, uh, it's figurative. I don't know that they were really saying, oh, God is looking down on me and I am subconscious of that. But, but God is saying you have acted as if you were living like somebody who says, well, God never sees me because you're just not recognizing that I am here and that you answer to me. Uh, your wisdom and knowledge mislead you. When you say to yourself, I am. When you brag on yourself, 
that knowledge and that wisdom. Now, be careful of those two things. Those things can uh, have the look of something that's right, but they can actually be something that is fooling you. Because knowledge, well, everybody knows this. Get in line, everybody knows this. And this is a wise decision. And if you get enough people, it sounds wise. But don't follow a crowd to pervert justice. Deuteronomy says, don't do that. Don't look at that as if it, well, everybody knows or everybody has the same wisdom. Uh, be leery of that. Uh, because there is this, this principle right here. God is saying, your, your wisdom is what got you here. So, don't trust it. Verse 11, disaster is going to come on you. And you will not know how to conjure it. You see that God is using the play on words there. You won't know how your magic spells, see, your sorceries, the things that you're doing by divination or you're calling on these gods to come and save you and you're using these incantations, for lack of a better word, or, or maybe these ideas that you are connecting yourself in some way to this idol, that idol is not going to be able to stop what's happening. A calamity will fall on you that you cannot ward off with a ransom. You can't conjure it. You can't buy it. It is a catastrophe you can't foresee. And it will suddenly come on you. So, look at what God says. Verse 12. Keep on then with your magic spells. Anybody got anything different there? Keep on then. Enchantment. Ma'am? Enchantment. Yes. Anybody got anything different than keep on? Everybody says keep on. Stand now. Stand now. Stand fast. Stand fast. Now, look at what God is doing. What is he saying there? Stand fast? Well, we know what that means. Like, don't move. <clears throat> Stand still. With what? With your magic spells. So what is God doing when he says that? That way. What would we call that? Yes, he is going to let him say that it's not going to work. But what do we call that kind of verb usage? What do we call that tone or that temperament? Keep on then. It's sarcasm. It's sarcasm. It's sarcasm. Stand still then in, in your God. Stand still. Be firm. Now, does he really mean that? It's not that he wants them to stand still. He is using that spirit to say, look, if you're going to continue to reject me and, and live like this, just keep on doing what you are doing. Let those who are vile continue to be vile. Let those who are wicked continue to be wicked. That There is a spirit to which God is using what we would label a sarcasm. And that's what this is. It is not uh, unbiblical to think about God using sarcasm. That's the same thing. I want to yell it up. You ever tell your kids, just keep doing that. Exactly. Keep just keep on. Yeah. <laughs> now, do you really mean just keep on? What you mean is one more time I'm going to get up. Okay. Now, we all understand that. And that is exactly what God is doing. Well, it could be a stand fast. It's like a warning. It, if you stand fast, oh, we'll see what you're doing. You leave. might be wrong. And that for warned. sure it's a warning. For sure it is a warning. Yeah. That is absolutely what he's trying to paint. I think the Lord was saying, keep on and I'm going to leave you. Yeah. Uh, well, he's already in a position of ready to discipline them. Yeah. But they are stuck in this 
pattern of idolatry. And God is going to kind of spell it out here. Uh, in verse 12, he says, Keep on then with your magic spells and with your many sorceries which you have labored, look, from childhood. Yeah, this isn't new. Mm -hmm, There's a long time investment. This, this isn't new. I mean, that you even go back to, for, is it First Samuel, right at the end of the book, when Saul goes to the witch of Endor, literally because he's scared of the Philistine army. And I mean, this, this is not new. Mm -mm. It's not as though they've come up with some brand new thing. And God is, that's why there's sarcasm. It's, you know it doesn't work. Yep. Keep on trying it. It's, right. it's not going to change. It hasn't worked before. It's not going to work now. Even the so Egyptian sorcerers. Just to Babylon, Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. He's, what now? He's saying just to Babylon. That's correct. That's right. You've seen it. That's before. right. Why would you keep doing it? That's right. It is, uh, it is absolutely uh, God is using their behavior mm -hmm. and he is showing why they are going to be guilty of this condemnation that he is bringing on them. And he's saying, you think all these things will work, all your right. magic right. and all your sorcery. That's right. And, uh, you think it's going to work, but you just wait and see. No, you're, you're not going to be able to conjure away my coming. When I knock, you're going to answer. When I call, you're going to come. You won't be able to buy yourself out of that situation. He's already mentioned Cyrus is coming. That's right. We've already seen that Cyrus is coming, and he's going to be the one to deal with them. It's just typical human nature, though. They, like you, the example of Saul and the witch of Endor, he's scared, and instead of running to God, he tries to run to something else because God didn't answer him the way he wanted to answer yep. right then. Yep. Same way with Babylon. They've tried so many different things to get away from God, and God says, but that's foolishness. You're not going to get away from me. And as a matter of fact, keep on trying what you're trying. I wish you would. Mm -hmm. It's just going to make, when I show up, it's going to make what I told you even that more impactful. The, the success of this is not going to happen. Even though, verse 12, uh, the Lord leaves this, it's, it's, it's sarcasm. That's what's happening here. At the end of verse 12 where he says, perhaps you'll succeed. Yeah. Okay? That's not like... God is not really concerned that they might. It's it's a mockery, is what it is. Okay. You think you'll succeed? Yeah. Right. You're going. That's right. You're going to you trust in it, succeed. but you're going to find out that that is not uh, how it's going to happen. All the counsel that you've received has worn you out. Let your astrologers come forward. God says. Those stargazers. See, he's calling them out. The people that are implicating this, that are leading this path, that are leading to this false confidence. Well, that's not going to work. What's Let, the monthly prognosticator? Yeah, somebody that's making, uh, like an astrologer, somebody that's Every making, month. you know, that's looking at the stars by, month by month. Correct. They're predicting something, well, okay? I mean, this, you know, I've got hated sorcery. But yet he used a form of that that it looked like to the people when he used Moses' staff and all that. It would make them think that was sorcery, and it was. And why would he use that kind of magic? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Uh, sorcery is designed to deceive. Yeah. He wanted to say it, but that's the major difference between the two. Doing something supernatural reveals God's power. Yeah. Doing something that is inherently a lie yeah. is to deceive the people. So but I would say, David did not know it was a sorcery. A lot of these people. Acts chapter eight. Uh, Simon, no, no. Simon the yeah, okay. Simon the sorcerer had deceived the people for a long time, and they thought that he had the power of the great God, is what Acts chapter 8 says. So whatever he was doing was, in fact, according to your description, it was deceiving the people. But uh, when God does something that is miraculous, it does not deceive anybody. So... It looks like, it, I agree, that when God does something, 
you know, like he divides the, the Red Sea. That's supernatural, and that looks like what we would call a trick, yeah. but it is not with the same purpose. Uh, a trick is more uh, in line of deception, okay. and God is revealing himself by his power. Babylon at this point Come on. is flying high. Ooh, they're, they're, the, mm. they're the mightiest empire in the world. And it, 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 if you look what, at the end of 13 where it talks about it, this one says that uh, from what is about to happen. That's right. It, it, it doesn't look like there's a chance that anybody no. could defeat them. No. And uh, so, you know, it's nope. uh, they don't look like they're going down. No. And uh, he's, he's saying that this is coming. Are, even though you don't yep. think. This is coming. That's right. And, and that's what's so, that's the message that's really hard for people to get is that that reality, God is already in the mix and He's already decided. He already knows this is what's going to happen. But it's, it's the people that struggle to embrace that. No different to the coming judgment. You know, God has already decided that that's going to happen. And there will be people that are going to be lost on the day of judgment. And God has warned that day is coming. But it don't look like it. Sun goes up every day. For the last 47 years, I ain't been tracking it that long, but close to it. Okay, sun comes up every day, goes at night, day and night, seasons change. Looks like everything's staying the same to me. I got investigating for 40 years, so it doesn't look like anything too far in the future. And that's kind of how men situate their mind. And they get comfortable there, and they don't hear what God is saying. And they don't perceive it. They're not interested in it. And they're not going to believe it even if they come and say, this is what God says is going to happen. Just like Babylon. This is a perfect illustration of our present scenario. Beware of, your own Beware of your own wisdom. You have to have it in your mind to you know what's going to come yep. toward the end. So the, the purpose is to stay what yep. God wants us to do and, yep. and stay in that range yep. and don't step out of it because if you do, this is what's going to happen. To admit, hey, we're a wicked country that has overdone our... Uh, aggression that has acted uh, defiantly toward God it, that takes a great deal of humility it also takes a righteous leader to be in that spot and at least at this point Nebuchadnezzar is not there now he's going to get there at himself anyhow God is going to humble him but at this point he is still kind of on the conquest field of view as far as his mind is concerned. You know, uh, in Isaiah 13 it says, In Babylon the glory of kingdoms and the beauty of the Chaldees excellent see, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. It shall never be inhabited, ne yep. never shall it be dwelt. That's right. Generation to generation, neither shall the Arabs pitch a tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold. Yep. Only wild beast and weird thing. Right. The Lord is going to turn it into yeah. what what feels like a very you know modern thriving place is going to be a barren wasteland. One of the interesting things that goes along with that, Betsy, is that uh, well, so let me forget who was the leader there of Iraq before they got thrown down. Saddam. Saddam Hussein. 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 Yeah, he tried to rebuild Babylon. Yes. Be kind of a yes. uh, of a. Uh, Show place. Yes. Uh, it didn't get finished. Yeah. No, I don't know. It didn't get finished. And so there's pictures of today, you know, where he started. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's still yeah. just that. I wonder why it didn't get finished. I wonder. That's right. The Lord knows he what he's doing. He said he would shake the heavens and the world mm -hmm. when he destroyed it. So this is what's going to happen. All these people that are presently doing this terrible, misleading behavior checking the, uh, the stars, checking their potions, casting their spells, that's not going to save them. Verse 13. Even though they think it's going to. Surely they will be like stubble. 14. The fire will burn them up. 
They cannot even save themselves from the power of the flame. These are not coals for warmth. This is not a fire to sit by. That is all they are to you. We're talking about those people who would be the magicians and those star casters, the fortune tellers, the predictors. That's what they are. They're like a coal. These, go ahead. Kind of ironic here, you know, that the three children were able to save, God was able to save them. He was able to save them from the fire. Out of a fire, said, yeah. You're not going to be able to. Yeah. It, that is a remarkable parallel. And uh, Daniel, I mean, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I mean, live in all of our minds as a powerful example of all the multitude following the wisdom. All the multitude was following the knowledge of the king. Bow down. Bow down. Three did not. Three said, you can throw us in there all day long. God can, God can save us, but even if he don't, we're going to go. You can throw us in. And they are heroes in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, which is no small thing. Uh, all of them go in on their error, and uh, there is not one that can save. Woo. Brutal. Uh, God is going to bring judgment on Babylon. They don't believe it. They don't anticipate it. Their stargazers are not predicting it. But it's not going to stop God. He's going to come at the right time, in the right season. And as the nation deteriorates, especially after Nebuchadnezzar is gone, uh, because his leadership, you know, he, uh, he was like... Uh, uh, Manan, is it Manan, the guy that uh, lives so wickedly and then repents just right before Mike, is that his name? He's one of the last kings there. Manan, is that right? Am I saying it right? Uh, the Babylonian king? No, uh, of Israel, who lived wickedly, wickedly, and then he repented right before he died. But his, his life was so bad that he left, you know, like a terrible stain, if you will. Manasseh. It's Manasseh. That's who I remember. That's who it is. Manasseh is a terrible king. He, he reigns for like 50-something years. And he's a horrible, 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 terrible king. And he influences the whole nation. And then right before he dies, he gets right with God. But... Day late and a dollar short because the the cavern that he had dug in the nation, all the people were following in that, and God just continues to use his name in a not so good way uh, in the record. Anyhow. So he wasn't saved? Are you saying he was not saved? <laughs> that, that's not the point. My point but is, he, was saved he, he did reconcile to God, yeah. but his wickedness had been so vile and so influential in so many years that it started so many trends that could not be reversed. Yeah. His influence was still going. I always wonder about Solomon. Right? Yeah. Solomon. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. He turned away from God. God told him if, 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 if. Yep. But he saw and knowledge he didn't. and stuff. Yep. But I always wonder when Ecclesiastes was written. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the record of the kings. This is the twelfth chapter. <laughs> the record of the kings indicates that he uh, was unfaithful, and yeah. uh, even Nehemiah speaks of his unfaithfulness uh, later on. So that would be long after his death. Uh, if he had repented and changed his life, you know, uh, as if Ecclesiastes was kind of his final chapter, 
then you would think that Nehemiah would have said a possible word about that, but he doesn't. He, he speaks of him as if he defiled the nation. He's the one that brought this in. He's the one that brought these women in. He's the one that did that. And it started a curveball. And that even, was even though it was his son, it was his influence that split the, the that's nation right. up. Yeah. Yep, for sure. Forty eight. Listen to this, you descendants of Jacob, you who call the name of Israel and uh, come from the line of Judah. You who take oaths in the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth or righteousness. Underline that. That tells you what God expects. People that He is in covenant relationship with he expects that they would be possessing and living because those are qualities that reflect him this has made a change now then notice from Babylon yes. to Israel for sure I, I'm sorry I should have said the chapter ends I, I didn't I said it last week but Babylon is over at 47 is the way it <coughs> is the way it's reading here. So you can see that there is a, uh, a clear ending to that particular <clears throat> conversation that's happening there in 46 and 47. Uh, you had the gods of Babylon being uh, rebuked and chastised and then Babylon itself in 47. So now there's a little theme change here. Uh, listen to this, you descendants of Jacob, you who call on the name of Israel and come from the line of Judah, you who take oaths in the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but do not in truth or righteousness. You who call yourselves citizens of the holy city and claim to rely on the God of Israel, the Lord Almighty is His name. Listen to what God is going to do. I foretold the former things long ago. Concentrate on that. I foretold the former things long, long ago. My mouth announced them, and I made them known. Then suddenly I acted, and they came to pass. For I knew how stubborn you were, your neck muscles were of iron, your forehead was of bronze. Therefore, I told you these things long ago, before they happened. I announced them to you, so that you could not say, my image brought them about. My wooden image and metal God ordained them. You have heard these things. Look at them all. Will you not admit them? From now on, I will tell you of new things. All right, so God repeats this theme. We've seen this multiple times in the 40s here uh, of Isaiah. And we've looked forward and found some other places where that spirit is equally marked. And we'll, we'll mark them as we go forward too. But for sure, this has been a pounding theme. I've told you. And because I'm telling you, it validates my integrity. God is challenging. There's no image that has had that kind of conversation with them. Why would they continue to...
press themselves into relationship, into bed with those images that cannot do what God is doing here. There is so much that is relational here. It's sweet. It's tender. You, you are my citizen. You, you're called by my name. There's a belonging. God feels compelled. If you've ever had a kid that has gone astray, then you know what that feels like. To have that kind of conversation with that kid to try and bring them back. And sometimes in your conversation where you're trying to bring someone back, you try to <coughs> validate your love for them. You try to validate your credibility. You should hear me because I've loved you and cared for you. I've paid for your stuff. I've carried you to the doctor. I took care of you when you couldn't take care of yourself. And you validate, hey, that's the reason that you should listen to me now. That's what God is doing. That is exactly what God is doing here. He's painting a picture. So, man, when you read that, it, it sometimes it feels like God is coming at him with a club. But he really, I mean, it is a club, but it's a club of love. And it is a club that is designed to bring them back. It's a rod of discipline is what it is. Well, earlier in Isaiah, uh, the Lord said, they worship me with their mouth, mm. but their heart is far mm. from me. Mm. And he also repeated it in the, uh, Matthew. Yes. Matthew. Yeah. Yes. yes. Even during the time of Jesus, that same sentiment was going on. Absolutely. And that's why that's why the preaching of Isaiah was pulled forward into, you know, interjected into that present society because the same issues that were happening during that day, we're happening during the days of Jesus. And look, now same we thing. still have same that thing. same application today. And that's a great grab from that. But there is a very tender, God disciplines those He what? Those He loves. He disciplines those He loves. So if you're seeing God with a club, then look at that club has love written all over it. That's what he's doing. One of the things we always advise parents is if you're going to discipline your child, take a breather between the action that happened that caused the discipline and your physical discipline. Because you don't want to physically discipline them while you're angry. Mm -hmm. Because then it's hard for you to express the love that we're talking about. So God is, has consistently, from throughout creation, has consistently modeled that. They do something, yep. there is this time of, are you going to recognize what you've done? Are you going to change? If not, here comes the discipline. But the discipline is not done out of anger. Nope. And it's not done out of fury. It's nope. done out of, hey, look, nope. your behavior is incorrect. Mm -hmm. This is a corrective discipline, and the idea is to get you back where you belong, yep. which is with me. That's where you're supposed to be. Yep. Uh, and when you do that as a parent, you, you see the, the outcome of that. Yeah. A child appreciates that, even maybe if they don't in the, in the minute. That's right. They, and God uh, is always, that's a very good comment about uh, bringing them back to Him. That's where ultimately He wants His discipline to shoo them back to Him. And... So he comes, but he is using his integrity as... Now, this is a parent takeaway and a grandparent takeaway because God is using his integrity. And what he's saying is, you can trust what I'm saying. If I say I'm going to bring this to happen, if I say I'm going to bring Cyrus, if I say I'm going to deliver you, if I say... This is what's going to happen to Babylon. If I say 70 years, and I do it, then you can trust me. Alright, so the lesson from us, 
for, for us as grandparents mm -hmm, and parents, discipline has to be connected to our integrity. If we discipline, uh, don't do what I do, do what I say. Uh -huh. Now if we act like that, no kid is going to respect that. And God doesn't act like that. And so here, he is laying out his integrity on the line. He just puts it out there. Oh, that we would do ourselves such a favor. If we would be that vulnerable with our family, with our church family, and just lay out there what we're going to do. And then we would be honored by doing it. And it would also keep us uh, connected. That's not the word. But you know the church never does that anymore. We, uh, we do. They stopped when it said to do it. It yeah. definitely said to do it. But you don't have church discipline. I've heard, hadn't heard of it in years. Yeah. There, there is a, a great need for church discipline. And that was just recently one of our discussions on Thursday night. Mm -hmm. uh, because God disciplines. Yeah, and does. if we are Jesus disciplines. He disciplines the seven churches in Asia. And he disciplines. And it needs to be something that we get serious about. For us, the primary issue is a discipline has to come from a trusted place where integrity is expected. What's a and deposit withdrawal system? If I haven't put anything in, then it's impossible for me to take something out. So the, the fear is if we're not putting in enough time into building the relationships with people, then to come with a heavy hand of discipline when you have no bridge there, it, 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 it does come across incorrectly many times. Uh, and sadly, it's, it's been done inappropriately and incorrectly for years because there's been no effort to build a relationship, so therefore there's no deposit for the end, and there's only a withdrawal, so therefore to the outside world and even to the person being disciplined, you've disciplined me with no love. You've just disciplined me with this club, uh, and there's got to be at some point some type of, hey, we've deposited into your relationship, now we can discipline you. There, there is this uh, description. No discipline seems pleasant. Every kid that I have had who has undergone discipline thought I was the meanest parent ever. It's true. Every kid will. If you don't have that reputation, count yourself as not disciplining. Some form of discipline doesn't always have to be something like you swatting a hand, but there got to be a measurement of discipline. If you love those grandbabies, they got to know that you mean what you say. Even you, you don't get the pass of, well, you're the grandparent and you can spoil them little critters, and I got one too. And if you think I'm going to spoil her, you are wrong about that. I want to shower her with love, but I will not pass on discipline. I'm not going to do it. that said, and if you do so, so and so, I say don't eat with them. Yeah. Don't have yes, First Corinthians to do 5. With them, but does anybody do that? First Corinthians 5. Yes, people do. Absolutely, because we we should not associate with someone that is living defiantly as a child of God. We should not associate with someone who is living defiantly against God. That's right. Go ahead, Butch. With the discipline you do to them, as they grow up and have kids of their own, they're going to do the same thing and then get the understanding from the child that he, daddy means wife. That's right. That's and right. Same thing the Lord does. He tried to discipline the people. That's right. So the people understand He's the Lord. That's right. 
our our lives, all of you sitting in this room have been disciplined. And you understand the value of that and the place of that and the need for that. And God is absolutely here's here's the place for God. Rank him as the perfect disciplinarian. Nobody better than God. If you want to follow a parent, follow God. Look at how he deals. Uh, if you read through at the end of Leviticus, there are uh, several times where at like 24 or something like that, where God comes to them and says, if you do this, and you disobey me, and you do this, I will discipline you seven times. It just means God will discipline to the right, correct measure, to the fullest. And He says it over and over and over in that chapter. God's discipline was always consistent and always consistent. impartial. You know, that's, that's the ease. He's not impartial. Know. Jacob, he, he loved Joseph more than other babies because of who his mother was. You want God to act like that? You want to be Reuben? You want to be Simeon? Now, you know in your heart that God doesn't do that. He doesn't show that kind of irreverent favoritism. God shows favoritism between the righteous and the wicked. Sure enough. But you can have just as much favor of God as anybody. God doesn't show favoritism from that kind of human standpoint. We learn from Him. This is what we're learning. You know, he I is bringing his kids back mentally. Go ahead. I got suspended from school one time in high school, and my mother literally made me chew up the suspension slip and swallow. That was my last suspension. <laughs> so, <laughs> next time your grandkids mouth off, tear them off a piece of paper. It won't hurt them. It's a part of a tree. It's nature, right? Won't hurt them. It'll come out. That's right. That's is still here. It didn't hurt her a bit. All right. We'll pick up right there next time. Thanks, everybody.